coming up on Network Africa. Three people killed after a bus attack in Kenya. Tunisia's Prime Minister-designate announces the formation of Cabinet Ministers. Plus, we look at major developments in the African economy in 2019. Hello and a warm welcome to the program. I'm Teniola Shobowale. We begin today in Kenya, where three people have been killed after a bus was attacked close to the Somali border. Two others were injured and are being treated at local clinics. The bus was traveling from Mombasa and was targeted in Lamu County, where heavily armed men stopped it and sprayed it with bullets. The gunmen have not been identified, but the Somalia-based Al-Shabaab militant group has carried out a number of attacks in the country. Kenya has troops in Somalia supporting the UN-backed government in its fight against Al-Shabaab. The country has been on high alert over the Christmas and New Year holiday period following intelligence reports that Al-Shabaab could carry out attacks. To politics now, the Tunisian Prime Minister-designate has announced the formation of a cabinet of independent technocrats more than a month after he was picked to head a government focused on reviving the economy. Habib Jamili, an agricultural engineer by training and a nominee of the Madras Islamist and Nada party, says the new government comprises of independent Tunisians but stopped short of disclosing their names. Tunisia's official news agency, TAP, said... Jamli had presented the proposed government to President Kais Saeed, who will ask Parliament to set a session for holding a confidence vote on the lineup. The government must be endorsed by the majority of Parliament, 217 members. Now, the United Nations and government forces in the Central African Republic have declared a flashpoint district in the capital, Bangui, where recent clashes claimed dozens of lives, a weapon-free zone. More than 30 people were killed last week, according to the Red Cross, as fighting erupted in the mainly Muslim PK-5 neighborhood between local fighters and traders, angered by extortion. But now the UN has stepped in, calling on both sides to disarm. A Minusca spokesman says, the CAR government will deploy patrols by the domestic security forces and a police commissioner will be sent to PK-5. The CAR has been gripped by sporadic violence since 2014 after then-president Francois Bozizé was removed in a coup. Fierce fighting then erupted between predominantly Christian and Muslim fighters, prompting the intervention of former colonial power France under a UN mandate. Still on security, two suspects have been arrested by the Lagos State Police here in Nigeria for allegedly hijacking a petrol tanker. The State Police Commissioner explains that his officers have been on the trail of the syndicate for quite some time before they were eventually arrested. As the Lagos State Police Command continues in its efforts to curb crime, its latest feat is the arrest of two suspects in the interior area of the state over the hijacking of a loaded petrol tanker. Itire Access Road and the location of the Divisional Police Station made it easy to apprehend the suspects. It's not the first time complaints are coming from all companies and tanker drivers at the loading bays in Apapa that men dressed in uniform forcefully take their products along the Maltu Expressway. Anytime they arrest our truck, our driver, they told us they, told us they, they are using Soldier uniform, like say a soldier, they are collected the trucks. If the truck they collect the truck in the night, in that night they will go discharge the foil. In the morning they will come pack the truck for road. So we will come see our truck empty. This is happening in so many times. This is the response by the police. They did uh, a lot of uh, underground work. 
they work closely with those truck owners and uh, they gave out numbers to them to alert them whenever they have any of such incidents. So they were on the lookout for the syndicate. So this is a syndicate that uh, specializes in um, snatching petroleum uh, product, hijacking the vehicle and taking it to uh, some destinations where they discharge them. The suspects claimed they were hired by four men dressed in military uniforms to drive the trucks to an unknown destination. They called me yesterday, say, can I drive a truck? I said, no, I'm not a truck driver. Then I call Osta, my friend. Where is the John Walker? I don't know the barracks working, but they always come to the my two with a uniform, I mean uniform. The police say investigations will soon reveal those behind the act. We are working closely also with um, neighboring states where we think some other syndicate members are to see how we can bring an end to this completely. So we are determined. We are on it already. Investigation has commenced. The suspects in our custody will uh, soon be charged to court. A search of the vehicles led the police to some of these documents and other evidence that will be examined closely to bring anyone involved to book. Away from security to health matters, maternal mortality rates remain unacceptably high in Nigeria. This is due in part to blood loss during and after pregnancy. This next report looks at the importance of blood banks and blood donations to life. Our correspondent, Miri Alale Yusuf, reports. Maternal mortality affects socioeconomic development because surviving children must be cared for by others. Globally, in 2017, 810 women died every day from preventable causes related to pregnancy and childbirth. In Nigeria, the mortality rate, according to the National Demographic and Health Survey, is 512 per 100,000 live births. A lot of this is due to hemorrhage during and after pregnancy. The Lagos state government is moving to ensure blood is made available by encouraging Nigerians to become habitual donors at this enlightenment program. Hemorrhage remains the leading direct cause of maternal deaths globally. And that means that at least one quarter of maternal death can be prevented once blood is made available. Blood cannot be manufactured, hence the call for donors. The few who come forward cannot meet the demand from not just mothers, but people who lose blood in other situations, such as accidents and illness. I think we need to honor the people that take their time voluntarily to go out of their way in a place like Lagos to give blood. How is this demand to be met? If you explain the reasons and you have your data and scientific facts, it is easier to convert somebody from believing what is not to what it is. The World Health Organization has determined that the safest blood supply is from voluntary, non-remunerated donors. That's because a voluntary donor is more likely to give it some thought and live a healthy life. We see a bit of how knowledgeable the public is about blood donation and its procedures. Did they give you any blood sample? Well, from uh, the law, uh, massive. No matter yeah. how you bring the patient sample, the baby and the mother sample. He is not aware that he should have brought a sample of the patient's blood. Before blood is given to a patient, it goes through a rigorous process of screening, which starts with cross-matching. By this time, it has already been checked for disease pathogens and discarded if infected, but stored at a specific range of temperatures if disease-free. Cross-matching is carried out by mixing small amounts of the patient's blood with the donors. This shows if they are compatible if the cells are destroyed, the journey ends here. The blood is incubated at body temperature for some time to detect any antibodies which may be harmful to the recipient. If present, that match is abandoned. Blood which passes all tests is tagged and can be transfused almost immediately or transported to desired locations in special boxes with ice packs. Donated blood lasts just 35 days. 
No wonder the call for more voluntary habitual donors. Mary Alale Yusuf, Channels Television News. Now, the United Nations World Food Program, WFP, has warned that millions of Zimbabweans pushed into hunger by prolonged drought and economic crisis face an increasingly desperate situation unless adequate funding for a major relief operation materializes quickly. With nearly 8 million people, half the population, now food insecure, WFP plans to double the number of people it assists, up to 4.1 million, but needs over 200 million US dollars for its emergency response in the first half of 2020 alone. Elias Shamba is a 53 year old farmer with 24 family members in Zimbabwe. Last year, he only harvested six bags of maize and lost two rounds of planting to drought. When WFP food assistance ran out, he collected bogs at night from the trees to supplement his mill. Years of drought have slashed food production in Zimbabwe, once an African breadbasket. Last year's maize harvest was down 50% on 2018, with overall cereal output less than half the national requirement. By August of last year, WFP was forced to launch an emergency lean season assistance program to meet rising needs months earlier than anticipated. Since then, food shortages have become ever more pronounced. In December, Maize was only available in half of the market's WFP monitors countrywide. 2019 has been an exceptionally tough year for all Zimbabweans. We see a factor or a combination of factors, economic uh, downturn, climate change and subsequent droughts that have led more than 8 million people into food insecurity. As in WFP, we're looking at ramping up our response over the next couple of weeks to reach almost double of what we have planned. Warren Lee. Runaway inflation, a symptom of the wide-ranging economic crisis Zimbabwe is experiencing, has propelled the prices of basic commodities beyond the reach of all but the most privileged. Amid dire shortage of foreign exchange and of local currency, Zimbabwe has seen drastic price increases. Bread now costs 20 times what it cost six months ago, while the price of maize has nearly tripled over the same period. Things are rotting in this market because of prices. Because today tomatoes will, it will go 250, tomorrow 300 dollars, tomorrow 400 dollars, and people they don't have that that man. Soaring fuel prices and shortages lead to long lines of cars for fuel at the petrol station. The deepening hardship is forcing families to eat less, skip meals, take children out of school, sell off livestock, and fall into a vicious cycle of debt. There is little respite expected for the most vulnerable, including subsistent farmers who grow most of Zimbabwe's food and depend on a single increasingly erratic rainy season. Because drought and flooding have tightened the availability of food across much of southern Africa, much of the nearly 200,000 metric tons of food required to deliver assistance to the 4.1 million people targeted by WFP must be sourced beyond the continent shipped to neighboring South Africa or Mozambique and moved by road into landlocked Zimbabwe. So ahead on the program, I bring you a story about the power of music, helping a convict transcend the confines of a cell in Burkina Faso. That's in a moment. Stay with us. <laughs> 